Okay. Hello. We're glad you've joined us for this live webinar, combining procalcitonin and a highly multiplex syndromic respiratory panel to optimize antimicrobial stewardship in patients with lower respiratory tract infections. I am Michelle Ashton of Labyrinth, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. Today's educational web seminar is presented by Labroots, the leading scientific social networking website and provider of virtual events and webinars advancing scientific collaboration and learning. Brought to you by BioMiru, a world leader in the field of in vitro diagnostics for more than 55 years. BioMiru is present in 43 countries and serves more than 160 countries with the support of a large network of distributors. BioMiru provides diagnostic solutions, systems, reagents, software, and services, which help determine the source of disease and contamination to improve patient health and ensure consumer safety. Its products are mainly used for diagnosing infectious diseases and some critical illnesses. The company's diagnostic solutions are also used for detecting microorganisms in agri-food, pharmaceutical, and cosmetic products. To learn more, visit www.biomiru.inc.com. Let's get started. You can pose questions to the speaker during the presentation while they're fresh in your mind. To do so, simply type them into the drop-down box located on the far left of your screen labeled Ask a Question and click on the Send button. Questions will be answered after the presentation. To enlarge the slide window, click on the arrows at the top right-hand corner of the presentation window. If you experience technical problems seeing or hearing the presentation, just click on the Support tab found at the top right of the presentation window or report your problem by typing it into the Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen. This is an educational webinar and thus offers free continuing education credits. Please click on the Continuing Education Credits tab located at the top right of the presentation window and follow the process to obtain your credits. I now present today's speaker, Dr. Devendra Amin, Medical Director of Critical Care Services, Medical Surgical ICU, Neurocritical Care ICU at Morton Plant Hospital in Clearwater, Florida. To learn more about our speaker, please click on the Biography tab at the top of your screen. Dr. Amin, you may now begin your presentation. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. Um, thank you for joining us. It's an interesting topic with a lot of changes over my lifetime in medicine, uh, which makes things, I think, somewhat easier uh, to manage these uh, patients with respiratory tract infection. The objectives of the talk are to review and assess the burden of respiratory tract infection, upper and lower review the efficacy of the highly multiplex respiratory panel in this scenario, and also to review the data on antibiotic stewardship with procalcitonin. As you'll see, combining procalcitonin with the a highly multiplex respiratory panel has a great opportunity to help optimize antibiotic exposure in patients with respiratory tract infection. So I'll begin with a case, a clinical case, the kind of case that we see every day, um, seen recently in my experience at the hospital. 76-year-old female comes in with shortness of breath, cough, chest pain, mildly productive cough, breathing yellow sputum. She denied any fevers, uh, but her symptoms appeared to be worse at night. She also had some lower extremity edema and had a fall uh, from unsettings about two days ago without any uh, fractures. She was afebrile, her oxygen saturation was 97% on room air and had occasional basal crackles on auscultation. Her white count was 12,000, 80% polymorph. BNP was elevated at 1390. D-dime was also elevated at 940. And the PCT was less than 0.05 at about 4 p.m. when she first presented. Chest X-ray showed some infiltrate. The X-ray on the left-hand side is the one from the current admission, and the one on the right-hand side was from the previous admission about three weeks ago, three weeks prior. It was read as showing some basal infiltrate, um, possibly improved compared to the previous study. So a very ambiguous picture, a bunch of things in the differential diagnosis there, 
Could this be heart failure? Could this be a respiratory tract infection, viral, bacterial? And also the patient had an elevated D-dimer. Could there be a PE as to the cause of the patient's shortness of breath and symptoms? So at this point, uh, I'd be interested to know what the audience thinks about starting antibiotics based on the current information. Um, you'll see the question and answer there and an opportunity to respond. By the next morning, uh, the respiratory viral panel came back, which was negative, and the PCT was also in the normal range of 0 0.06. So based on this information and the clinical history, if one had started antibiotics, would anybody stop them um, or continue antibiotics? So the question is, would you stop antibiotics at this time, assuming they were started? And we'll review the answers later. So looking at acute respiratory tract infection, it's a very high uh, burden in children and adults, the third most common cause of death worldwide. Respiratory viruses account for probably 50 to 60% of respiratory tract infections. Rapid identification has the potential to reduce antibiotic exposure, but initial appropriate antiviral and, and to initiate appropriate antiviral therapy when needed for influenza. And then it may precipitate earlier discharge or discharge from emergency room to home uh, if there's a viral etiology as opposed to a bacterial infection, pneumonia, but probably possibly beyond the bronchitis. Uh, so it affects hospital admission, hospital length of stay, and can also impact on hospital infection control measures if you know the kind of organism you're dealing with, which in some cases need isolation, in many cases need isolation, in some cases that don't need isolation. Respiratory tract infections and non-influenza viral infections are the most common illness in humans. 72% of the survey patients had at least one episode in the previous year. Averaging about two and a half episodes a year with very common viruses, mild viruses like rhinovirus or enterovirus. Producing some 500 million episodes a year nationally in the US. Median duration of the illness is about 7.4 days. It can be quite debilitating and don't forget people are quite infectious in the first half of that usually and 20 million lost work days and 21 million lost school days as a result of this. There's an increased burden and severity of illness in patients with coexisting diseases such as asthma, COPD, and otitis media with an annual bill of approximately $40 billion. This is a study from the New England Journal in 2015 looking at community-acquired pneumonia patients that actually had an infiltrate and they looked to see if uh, there was any specific pathogen. So of the 3,600 or patients, about 2488 were eligible to go into the study with adequate data. 21% required ICU care and 2% died. 2,259 patients had X-ray changes suggested of pneumonia, uh, and this included bacterial and viral specimens. Pathogens were detected in 853 patients, but only 38% of patients. So about 62% of the time we didn't, or they didn't identify uh, the actual etiology of the illness. As you can see from the table there, viruses for about 23% of the infections, bacterial infections were identified 11% of the time. Only 3% of the time were they coexisting, viral and bacterial. Low percentage of fungal mycobacterial, and amongst the viruses, 9% were rhinovirus, 6% influenza, strep pneumonia at 5% and unknown 62, as we said. So this is the breakdown graphically. Um, they didn't really break out atypical pneumonias. That's going to be other than um, mycoplasma there, Legionella. But there are others, as we'll see, that also can contribute, especially chlamydia. Can, in some studies, as many as 10% can be chlamydia. Sorry. So this entity, when you have 60% of the patients where you don't know what's going on at the front end, leads to potential for overuse of antibiotics, which results in a safety risk to patients, developing development of antibiotic resistance, and other comorbidities such as the death. And this also increases the rate of death in patients who have unnecessary antibiotics as well. It's estimated 
of 2 million doses from 23,000 results. That's result from inappropriate antibiotic use. As we know, bacterial cultures can take some time to get results back, two to three days. Uh, they have a relatively low sensitivity. Uh, a faster, more accurate indicator of infection is needed to help in these critical decisions. Um, in milder patients, maybe not so critical, but in sicker patients, it's quite important to know as much as you can at the front end to help with appropriate therapy and triaging. So as I said, about 50% of antibiotics prescribed for acute respiratory infections are probably unnecessary from this study. There's about 68.9 million patients, about 34.3 million were felt to get antibiotics unnecessarily. So when used inappropriately, antibiotics carry the risks, as mentioned, with more serious illness or disability, higher death rates, prolonged recovery, and more frequent hospitalizations as a use of uh, unnecessary or prolonged use of antibiotics. And then this is very common in the two syndromes, especially a lower respiratory tract infection and in sepsis. So there's some tests that we use commonly already um, for, for detecting what kind of infectious pneumonia you might have. But we commonly use strep pneumonia antigen and the Legionella pneumonia urinary antigen. And they can come back fairly quickly. They help with triaging, they help with antibiotic selection or de-escalation fairly quickly. We've been using uh, influenza enzyme immunosorbent assays, EIAs, and PCRs, but they've been very slow. They can take a few days to come back and were costly. Uh, MRSA is something that we've been using for some time now as a nasal swab to help predict whether a pneumonia is related to MRSA or not. This has a highly uh, predictive negative value so that if a patient is negative for MRSA, you can de-escalate from adding on vancomycin in the setting of a healthcare-associated pneumonia and go get rid of that potentially toxic medication if the MRSA is negative in the PCR. And people follow that rule fairly well on the whole given its very high negative predictive value. The multiplex panels allow for detection of a multitude of viruses and a few bacteria, and they're now able to re re get results back within uh, an hour or two, depending on the lab and the logistics of getting a specimen from the patient to the lab and back to the EMR. So this study by Brenda et al. published in The Lancet uh, looked at the use of rapid diagnostics and antibiotic stewardship in respiratory tract infection. The hypothesis was that if you have this point of care, fairly quick turnaround uh, test, you would hopefully reduce uh, antibiotic initiation or at least duration uh, and maybe decrease length of stay. So despite having rapid identification of respiratory viruses, it was found that in the, um, in the actual results that the number of antibiotics initiated was really no significant, no significant difference in the two with the point of care testing versus not. So both groups got about 84% of the time had antibiotics. However, there was a reduction in the duration of antibiotics in these patients. And in the patient had the point of care testing, uh, there was a significant reduction in duration, one to two days of antibiotics. So that did help. The rapid molecular test for influenza and respiratory syncytial virus and other respiratory viruses, um, a systemic, this is a systemic review uh, looking at the accurate diagnostic accuracy and clinical impact. There's a retrospective review of a bunch of studies uh, that will go through the algorithm. Some of, this, some of the testing was just on influenza, some on influenza plus RSV, and there was the uh, biomary multiplex panel in this. And they used the methodology used by the Cochrane database for diagnostic accuracy testing. So it started off with some 4,100 studies, but after screening, looking at eligibility, and looking at uh, the criteria for diagnostics within each study, they came down to about 56 studies for diagnostic testing accuracy and 15 studies for impact of the uh, um, algorithm or the hypothesis. So it was felt that the accuracy of the newer test is actually very good. The pool sensitivity is about 91%. The pool specificity was about 96%. If you're only testing for influenza, they had a very high sensitivity and specificity. When you added um, RSV to that in, in the simplexa and others, the accuracy was pretty good, but the sensitivity of 99%. When you get into the uh, multiplex uh, assay, there's a slight reduction in the overall sensitivity, but that's for the entire panel. 
if you look at the specific influenza A, B, and RSV, there's a 97 to 99% sensitivity and specificity, so much more accurate. These tests also appear to be more accurate in children because their viral loads appear to be higher, and the more virions there are, the, the, the better the uh, sensitivity and the diagnostic accuracy of the test. And in this study, the turnaround time on average was less than three hours. But this did result in a reduced length of stay um, and also uh, more appropriate use of uh, Tamiflu or Seltamivir for patients diagnosed with influenza A or B. So there was some value. In the impact side of the study, uh, two were with the respiratory viral panel and PCT with guidelines, that is a combination of RBP and PCT. Viral pathogen detection may not necessarily attribute causation was one of the uh, thoughts coming out of the study because just because something's there doesn't always mean it may be the causative agent for the illness. So that was part of the uh, thought process in the study. Um, doesn't happen too often, but it's, it's possible. And the rapid molecular test for viral pathogen detection provided accurate results. The clinical impact of rapid diagnostic tests were conflicting. There is high quality evidence that rapid testing might decrease the length of hospital stay and might increase appropriate use of a Siltamivir and influenza virus infection. They suggested considering implementation of rapid molecular tests within hospital settings and recommend performance of high quality randomized studies. And I think the key to this was to actually get education on the ground. You can implement the test, you can put it in, but if you don't educate the people who are sending the tests and interpreting them for a clinical impact, to a high degree, then the test is useless. You have to have good, good education on the ground to allow people to determine that you have a test that has a high positive or high negative particular value and then follow the results and you get better results. There's a trend in that direction, but it's been slow as we've seen with other testing. This is a study, um, a pediatric study comparing six sample to answer influenza A and B and respiratory sensitive virus and the multiplex studies from respiratory specimens from children over a period of years, they looked retrospectively at samples that were available. Uh, compared to the FDA-approved assay, which was a reverse transcriptase uh, assay for A and B and RSV. So the sample to answer platforms based on uh, nucleic acid amplification detection of these viruses were simple, automated, and accurate. Their high sensitivity and specificity, as we've seen, had a rapid turnaround time which is the key to adoption. If you get the result back in the first day or first half day of the admission or within the ER time, you get a much higher um, application of the algorithm and people actually paying attention to the results uh, and maybe avoiding antibiotics if you get the results back quickly. Otherwise, the tendency is to start antibiotics and then continue them uh, for maybe two or three days longer than you might ordinarily do if you had the results back quickly. There was overall a decrease in antibiotic use and appropriate use of antivirals in this study as well. This is looking at the, the breakdown with flu. Again, a very high percentage of sensitivity and specificity to see across the, almost all the tests there. Influenza B, again, slightly lower sensitivity specificity compared to influenza A. That's common amongst most tests for this, except for the ones that are just measuring A and B. And then for RSV, um, again, a pretty good sensitivity specificity there um, all across the board. The BioFire Respiratory Panel menu provides a whole bunch of other viruses as well, 17 in total. Initially, I felt, and I think many people, did, you know, these are not so serious, they're, they're common, but they don't need significant treatment, so why no? Well, if they're hospitalized and you don't know, but you know they're not influenza A or RSV, all of these patients, as you can see from the CDC guidelines, they do require some form of isolation. If you have patients with a URI, a viral respiratory tract infection, who you think is bacterial and they're getting antibiotics, but all the time they're shedding virus and they don't have uh, appropriate airborne um, precautions or contact precautions or droplet precautions are necessary, then you're spreading the infection even though it may be mild. The other thing about the panel is that you also get Bordetella, Chlamydia, and Mycoplasma, and which require droplet uh, protection. So that's kind of important as well. Mycoplasma pneumonia 
as you know, we treat all four of those with um, Zithromax or fluoroquinolone, preferably with a um, Zithromax. And so it's important to know that. And once you have it, you can de-escalate antibiotics. So that's a very important part of the panel, we feel, and that does help with uh, antibiotic de-escalation or narrowing down what you're on. So the impact of a rapid respiratory panel test on patient outcomes, the implementation in the study of the BioFire film array respiratory panel to improve outcomes in the pediatric study before and after implementation. This is in children greater than three months with acute respiratory tract infection. They had batch PCR, influenza A and B, RSV and parainfluenza, and post-testing post when they had the new test available, which was with A and B, RSV, parainfluenza, one to four, uh, human metanumovirus, adenovirus, and rhinovirus and coronavirus. So that was the new test. And it was over two winter seasons. Interestingly, when you look at this study, um, in the pre-multiplex uh, study, number of patients, 216, there was no influenza A or B. And that was because from the paper they said that the previous year they had a very bad flu season and everybody got vaccinated. Uh, a lot of children got vaccinated, I guess not everybody, but a lot of patients in this study were vaccinated. They did not have influenza B, they had the other viruses. And some of them would not perform because they didn't have the test available. In the following year, uh, post RRP, so with the new assay, uh, they did see influenza and they were able to pick up these other viruses, uh, including human metanumovirus, almost 10% of the patients, um, as well as the other not so serious uh, respiratory viruses. And these were outcomes uh, related to timing of the test. Um, with the previous test, the average time uh, to test results uh, was about 490 minutes versus the new test about 290 minutes. That's a significant difference. PCR results received in the emergency room, 13% in the pre-RRP and in the post-RRP, it was almost 50% to patients got the test within the ER. So that's a significant change. Antibiotics, unfortunately, were still prescribed at a similar rate, about 72%, but antibiotic use and duration uh, was decreased a little bit, um, and then the inpatient length of stay was also reduced, but not significant. The emergency room length of stay was reduced in time, and time to isolation was, again, not significantly different. So it was felt from that say there was a positive result for RRP impacting outcome, it provided for early discontinuation antibiotics, a slight decrease in length of stay, and reduced time in isolation. So the impact from this study, RAPO study, impact of early detection of respiratory viruses by multiplex PCR on clinical outcomes in adult patients, and they compared two winter seasons, 2010-11 and 2011-12. And infections are diagnosed by conventional assays in the first season and by the multiplex Firefire assay in the second season. The film array decreased the time to diagnostic diagnosis of influenza compared to conventional by 1.7 hours to 1.7 hours from 7.7 .7 hours. That's significant. And the film array also decreased the time to diagnosis of non influenza viruses 1.5 hours versus 13.5. So that was significant. With Multivariate logistic regression showed that diagnosis of influenza by the biofire is associated with significant reduction in admissions, length of stay, duration of antimicrobial use, and number of chest radiographs as well. So the rapid turnaround was key, having the result early, and the multiplex nature of the test allowing for simultaneous infection of viruses and superior sensitivity to the film array may improve the evaluation management of patients suspected of having respiratory viral infection. So that's come a long way from when I started training um, in terms of what we could do. We did, weren't able to identify viruses that easily, or if we did, it took several days, it was very expensive. This has really changed the paradigm. So it allows you to send patients home fairly quickly if you have that diagnosis with a mild viral infection, um, or if they're influenza, they get hospitalized, they get the time of flu fairly quickly, assuming they haven't been waiting too long on the outside, uh, and get them appropriately triaged and treated. So the next part of the talk is looking at procalcitonin. A lot of us are familiar with using procalcitonin for managing sepsis, but in the respiratory tract infection world, I think it has a very good 
role, um, especially in the setting of viral infection with this negative predictive value, as we'll see. Not moving. There we go. So uh, it's been on the market since about 2007. Uh, it's two previously cleared uses in the USA to aid in the risk for sepsis and septic shock in the first year of ICU admission, and to determine the change in PCG level over time following ICU admission, which has a prognostic value to it. The PCG is a precursor of calcitonin, and it helps regulate the inflammatory response to bacterial infection. PCG is normally produced by many tissues. Only parathyroid, however, converts PCG to calcitonin. Normal serum concentration is about 0.05 nanograms per mil or less. Bacterial infection stimulates PCG production in multiple organs where the PCG is not broken down as it is in the parathyroid gland. And serum concentrations go as high as uh, or greater than 2.5, significant for bacterial infection, or greater than 0.25 and then can reach as high as 40 to 100, and we have our assay go up to 200, and we can see that uh, they can go up higher than that even uh, with a very serious inflammatory response to infection. So procalcitonin provides critical biomarker information. It's produced by numerous organs, as we said. PCT rises within about three to six hours of the bacterial insult, uh, a systemic bacterial insult. The half-life is about 20 to 24 hours. It allows for early identification and risk assessment, and elevated levels are highly suggestive of a severe bacterial infection. This has to be a systemic infection to cause the elevation. As you can see from this cartoon model here, um, if you have a viral infection, it stimulates interferon gamma, which actually does not stimulate uh, the homokine uh, calcitonin mRNA and does not produce an elevation in procalcitonin. If, however, you have a bacterial infection, you have a stimulation of uh, interleukin 1B, 1 beta, and TNF alpha, which stimulates the uh, calcitonin mRNA, which causes the Golgi apparatus to produce a lot more procalcitonin, sorry, procalcitonin that gets sent out into the um, serum and does not get cleaved by the enzymes which you would normally find in the parathyroid gland, hence the levels are very high. So viral infections do not elevate procalcitonin levels as bacterial infections do. So that's one way of differentiating the two. If you have a very low or negative procalcitonin elevation in the setting of a sick patient with bilateral infiltrates, which are not always from a bacterial infection, viral infections can produce the same level of inflammation in the lung, um, then you have good grounds to believe that this is not bacterial, this is viral. Also helping triage your antibiotics, as we'll see. This is the uh, timeline that you see with these various inflammatory markers. And within the first hour or two, interleukin 6, 10, and TNF alpha go up fairly quickly and come down. PCG takes about a couple of hours to start rising, continues to rise. And then as you take away the insult, um, the levels come down fairly predictably uh, if there's normal renal function. Um, let's see, next slide. PCT kinetics, as you can see, the levels rise fairly quickly after in the endotoxin infusion and they continue to rise at ongoing insult. However, the level drops down with a half-life of 24 hours as you take away the insult predictably by 50% per day. PCT levels significantly are higher in patients with bacterial co-infection compared to viral infection only on the left-hand side. You see a viral infection only and uh, you see a bacterial co-infection increasing the PCT when they have both infections, if it's a serious enough bacterial infection. PCT levels also correlate with disease severity, as it seems. If you have SIRS, sepsis, severe sepsis, or septic shock, the levels go up quite significantly, as you can see, and linearly. PCT levels also have a high negative predictive value, low risk of correct infection. So in the setting of uh, bacterial co-infection, there's a positive predictive value and a negative predictive value if the levels are low. The level is, uh, there's a very high probability that you have negative predictive value with a low PCT level. In the STOLT study, as you can see there, the sensitivity is 84%, specificity 98%. Positive predictive value when the PCT is high is 93%. The negative predictive value when the PCT is low is 94%.
PC is a critical biomarker for bacterial infection. It aids in assessing risk of the specificity of bacterial infection versus inflammation alone, rises rapidly after bacterial insult, declines rapidly with control of infection, and there's an excellent correlation with severity of illness. So in the lower respiratory tract infection, clinical characteristics are often not specific in patients present, as we said from the very first study that we showed, uh, case study that we looked at, cough, sputum, and fever, shortness of breath can be fairly nonspecific. Is it viral? Is it pneumonia? Is it heart failure? Um, all of those can occur with those conditions. And respiratory tract infections can present in many different ways, you know, whether it's acute bronchitis, pneumonia, or an acute exacerbation of CCD, or having very similar presentations and side effects. So the clinical characteristics, as we've seen, with cough, sputum, and fever, are very nonspecific. And then this ambiguity, almost everybody got antibiotics. So given the uh, tools that we have now with the viral markers and with the bacterial marker, I think it's more predictive now in, in how we're able to treat patients more accurately. So the Vitus Brahm CCT assay was the first assay to be cleared to aid in decision-making on antibiotic therapy for patients with suspected or confirmed lower respiratory tract infection. Defined as community-acquired pneumonia, acute bronchitis, acute exacerbations of chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, and an inpatient, in an inpatient setting or an emergency department setting. So the algorithm that recommended to follow is that the PCT value on the on initial presentation less than 0.1, probably you don't need antibiotics in the setting of a respiratory tract infection, strongly discouraged. <clears throat> if the PCT is 0.1 to 0.25, again, one would discourage the use of antibiotics if the patient is clinically stable. If, on the other hand, Given the clinical situation and the PCT is elevated at 0.26 to 0.5, one would encourage antibiotics, and certainly greater than 0.5 in the setting of a clinical picture of pneumonia, let's say, one would strongly encourage antibiotics. The de-escalation on kinetics allow for you to have a fairly rigorous methodology for discontinuing antibiotics. So the PCT drops down to less than 0.25, or has dropped by more than 80%, there's good data in showing that patients with pneumonia, bronchitis, exacerbation, CFD with a bacteria, if they have a bacterial infection, then one can discontinue the antibiotics safely at that point. Again, reducing the significant duration of antibiotics from several days, 10 days, down to uh, less than uh, four or five days. <clears throat> this was a study uh, published in The Lancet looking at records that 990 records from a literature search of which 71 articles were assessed for eligibility after exclusion of 919 records. Collected data on 6,708 patients from 26 eligible trials in 12 countries. So they looked at the patient level data which they're able to get from each of the study uh, principal investigators and they looked at mortality at 30 days which is significantly lower in pro calcitonin guided patients than in control patients, 9% deaths um, and the 3,336 3, procalcitonin guided patients versus 336 or 10% in 3,372 3, controls with an adjusted odds ratio of 0.83 with a confidence interval of 0.7 to 0.99. The mortality benefit was similar across subgroups by setting and type of infection with a p-value greater than 0 0.05, although mortality was very low in primary care and in patients with acute bronchitis, as one would expect. <clears throat> Brocalcitonin guidance was also associated with a 2.4-day reduction in antibiotic exposure, ranging from 5.7 versus 8.1, and reduction in antibiotic-related side effects, 16% versus 22%. So that's fairly significant. So the use of procalcitonin to guide antibiotic treatment in patients with acute respiratory infections reduces antibiotic exposure and side effects and improves survival. Widespread implementation of procalcitonin protocols in patients with acute respiratory infection stuff has the potential to improve antibiotic management with positive effects on clinical outcomes and on the current threat of increasing antibiotic multidrug resistance. 
if you look at the outlines of the meter analysis, looking at baseline characteristics, the respiratory tract infection, we looked at the effectiveness for initiation of antibiotics, effectiveness in antibiotic duration, exposure, and effectiveness in safety profile. <clears throat> baseline characteristics were similar between groups in LRTI patient level meter analysis uh, in terms of uh, distribution of sex, community acquired pneumonia, acute bronchitis, or acute exacerbations of COPD. PCT value initiation was 0.23. Um, this is 0.21. And then when you look at the effectiveness for initiation of antibiotics, you could see on the left-hand side of the panel, there's propensity to favor PCT with lower PCT is significant for uh, antibiotic initiation. So if you didn't start antibiotics based on the fact that PCT was less than 0 0.25, there were no uh, adverse outcomes based on that. As we move forward, you'll see that. And then if you had the, on the control patients, uh, which is on the right-hand side of that central line, uh, very few there, one just above and one a little bit beyond the right line. The PCD guidance significantly reduced antibiotic initiation, 71.4% versus 88.4%. And then if you look at the effectiveness for antibiotic duration of exposure, what we're seeing is, again, there's a deliberate reduction in duration exposure um, from the three randomized controlled trials. Patient level, at the patient level, it was seven and then, or 10 in the controls in days, and at the patient level, the total antibiotic exposure days, five versus nine. So there's a large reduction in antibiotic exposure in inpatient and emergency room settings for LRTI, as you can see in the two panels there. Uh, there's about a 38% reduction in antibiotic exposure um, from days of enrollment, and then even more so in the emergency room. Also for community-acquired pneumonia, fewer patients with CAP in PCP group on antibiotics through follow-up. And then you can see a 37% reduction in antibiotic exposure in terms of duration. And then for acute bronchitis, a very significant 65% reduction in antibiotic exposure. So a lot of patients weren't started, or if they were started, it was reduced earlier. And then fewer patients with acute exacerbations of COPD in the PCP group on antibiotics throughout follow-up. A 49% reduction in total exposure. If you look at the safety of doing this, you know, it's all very well stopping or reducing the antibiotic exposure, but did it cause any harm by doing that? You can see there was no significant difference in the uh, outcomes or um, the odds ratio was very similar in both in terms of risk. And here we see similar rates of mortality. So there's no difference in mortality if you follow the PCT uh, algorithm to reduce antibiotics. So you gain by reducing antibiotic exposure you gain by uh, less side effects, and you gain by not having an increase in mortality rate. And there was also a significant reduction in incidence of complications, which included death, ICU admission, hospitalization, rehospitalization, acute respiratory infection, specific complications, and recurrent or worsening infection. Hospital length of stay was similar in both. In acute exacerbation of COPD, is a slight reduction compared to the control groups. And then the 30-day mortality rate, uh, no significant difference. The peak, sorry, go back. The PCT can be safely and effectively used for two additional indications, which was brought up by the FDA in February 2017, to aid in decision-making and antibiotic therapy for patients with suspected or confirmed lower risk tract infection, defined as community-acquired pneumonia, acute bronchitis, and acute exacerbation of COPD, and to aid in decision-making and antibiotic discontinuation based on that meta-analysis. So it helps in decision-making on 
starting patients and also on discontinuing patients from antibiotic utilization. So this new indication is important uh, and may help reduce the unnecessary use of antibiotics, which is a serious issue, especially to get more and more problems with resistance, development of C. difficile, and then there's an overall safety risk of unnecessary antibiotic uh, exposure, as you can see. So PCT biomarkers can help guide effective treatment decisions. It's been thoroughly studied in cases of suspected LRTI and sepsis and associated with decreased antibiotic use without worsening clinical outcomes. So rapid detection using PCT can help with this, as was the case with the uh, viral PCR as well, or the multiplex panel. Again, all these, any tests you use has to be used in clinical context. And if you apply them appropriately in clinical context, it's a, it really strengthens your hand in antibiotic utilization. So it helps monitor P, help monitoring PCT levels, uh, gives you data to make better and more informed decisions, additional guidance for initiation and continuation of antibiotic therapy. It improves prescribing practices to slow the rise of resistant bacteria, and it supports the CMS guidelines for antibiotic stewardship and infection prevention. So, We've seen how the viral panel can work, and we've seen how PCT can work. So how do we optimize antibiotic stewardship in the setting where you have both available, which many places do now? Um, so with that combination, we should be doing much better with antibiotic utilization and reduce use of unnecessary antibiotics. So this study looked at uh, utilizing the respiratory panel, uh, viral respiratory panel and PCT to help in reduction of antibiotic exposure. Um, and the results were as follows. Well proven or possible respiratory infections as indicated by Monsex testing, respiratory bacterial culture, international statistical classification of disease and related health problems using the revised code for acute respiratory tract infection is the documented. The patients required to have an RP respiratory panel or PCC within the first 75 hours of presentation. Drug orders are evaluated for discontinuation of antibiotic therapy within 48 hours of a procalcitonin less than 0.25 and a positive viral respiratory panel result or both. So within 72 hours of presentation, uh, if you've got the data, um, you should be able to discontinue antibiotics if the viral panel was positive and the PCT was negative or low. What they saw was that with the low PCT, um, the, the two groups with the PCT level less than 0.25 and the positive viral panel uh, showed that the um, ICU admission rate um, was similar in both groups, was uh, sorry, higher in the low PCT group than in the positive viral panel group. Uh, the median length of stay was higher in the PCT group and positive viral panel was lower. So however, the antibiotics prescribed were much higher in the low PCT group than expected at 71%, but in the positive viral respiratory panel was uh, 28%, much lower. But if you had the PCT less than 0.25 and a viral panel that was positive, the um, IC admission rate was higher. Um, didn't make sense that. And the median, quarter, median length of stay was in between the viral and the PCT being low group and the antibiotics prescribed was significantly higher than the viral panel alone, so even with a low PCT. So it looked like the data was there, but people weren't really paying attention to that. As you can see, the antibiotic prescribed in the first 32 hours was about 70%, even with a low PCT of 0.25, significantly lower if you just had a viral study by itself, but even with a low PCT and viral panel uh, being positive, um, 60% of the patients got antibiotics. The so PCT and RP testing were obtained in 503 and 1823 patients, respectively. Um, results of these tests suggested 789 patients were potential candidates for antibiotic avoidance. These include 219 with a low PCT and 601 with a positive viral panel and 31 with both. Antibiotics were administered have the 39 patients, 39 percent of the patients in the first 72 hours but they were discontinued within 48 hours of laboratory data availability. So these results suggest that positive viral panels and low PCTs results are infrequently 
associated with discontinuous antibiotic therapy, improvement of pocketbook respiratory infections at, at their institution. Direct intervention to clinicians are likely to use the corrective behavior and decrease unnecessary antibiotic use. So on this, how much education actually went into uh, educating the, the, the staff um, or robust antibiotic uh, stewardship program in place to help direct uh, antibiotic therapy given a uh, positive viral panel and negative PCT. Clearly, education is the key. Doing any tests but not paying attention to the results doesn't add value. But if you actually pay attention to the results and you believe in the data uh, that's available, then it will produce results, I think, a significant reduction in exposure. This other study, uh, from a similar time frame, however, 300 patients hospitalized with non pneumonic LRTI October 2013 to April 2014 were randomized at a one to one ratio to receive standard care or PCD guided care and highly multiplex PCR testing. Primary outcome was antibiotic exposure and safety was assessed at one in three months. So you could see in the green line, non intervention groups the median uh, exposure was higher than in the yellow line, low PCT and viral positive. So in this study, people were paying attention and a significant reduction in antibiotic exposure, as you'll see. So among the 151 patients in the intervention group, viruses were identified at 42% and 83% had PCT values of less than 0.25. Again, there was no significant difference in antibiotic use or adverse events between intervention patients as a non-intervention group at the beginning. But subgroup analysis revealed fewer subjects with positive results of viral testing and low peak values who were discharged receiving antibiotics. So less people were sent home on antibiotics if they had a positive viral and negative PCT value. Shorter antibiotic durations among algorithm adherent interventions, patients versus non intervention patients, two versus four days. So that was a significant reduction in antibiotic duration compared with historical controls from 2008 to 2011. Where it's six days average. So, although antibiotic use was similar in the two arms, subgroup analysis of intervention patients suggest that physician responded to, physicians responded to viral and biomarker data. Um, and this hopefully is more fruitful as we go forward. So, briefly to the, the next case, the last case a um, 69 year old male with cough, congestion, short of breath, low grade fever for about 10 days, clear sputum, wife and grandchild had been sick with similar symptoms. Previous medical history of hypertension, coronary disease, congestive heart failure, diabetes, sleep apnea. Tmax was 99.5, occasional basal crackles and auscultation, hypoxic, 90% on room air, white count was low, PCT was low at 0.2, that's at 5 a.m. Uh, on the day of admission, and the chest x-ray again showed bilateral airspace disease, which is quite significant. And again, the first question is, given the information you had there, I think most people, given this question, would you start antibiotics, should probably say yes. More data. Um, patient was started on rosepin and dipsomastic community acquired pneumonia. The RBP, however, came back positive by 9 a.m. the following morning and was positive for human metanumavirus. And the PCG next was 0 0.15. So this is a non-bacterial infection and then, of course, the obvious question is, would you stop antibiotics on day two? We did, and the patient did fine. Um, but that's with a lot of experience in this setting. So, overall summary, rapid diagnostic results are important. Negative predictive value of a low PCT combined with a strong positive predictive value of highly multiplex respiratory panel has potential of reducing antibiotic exposure significantly. The uh, real-time uh, interventions improved results. So um, getting the sample to answer should be uh, SPA, sample to answer uh, with real-time intervention improves results and then reduces length of stay and ultimately reduce antibiotic costs and antibiotic associated complications. So that's the end of the presentation. Um, I think we'll be ready for questions shortly. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Amin, for your presentation. 
A quick reminder for our audience on how to submit questions. Simply type them into the drop-down box located on the far left of the presentation window labeled Ask a Question and click on the Send button. Dr. Amin will answer as many questions as time permits. All right, our first question is, what is the turnaround time for PCT and the respiratory panel? I'm sorry, for the, the time turnaround? Yes, what is the turnaround time? Yeah, in our hospital, we can usually get a PCT back. If it's a stat PCT, we can usually get it back within an hour, realistically, sometimes a little less. But to go from the patient to the lab and back again on the EMR, it's about an hour. Respiratory viral panel, it all depends on you know how the order gets picked up and then gets taken. But once the sample is taken, we can usually get it back in an hour or so. Great, thank you. Okay, next question. How reliable is procalcitonin when taken within the first 24 to 48 hours of presentation, but after antibiotics have been initiated? That's a very good question. Um, usually the patients, if they're, if they're very sick, they have bad pneumonia, it can take a couple of days for the PCT to turn around and start dropping down. But if it's a, let's say, a, a not so bad viral, a bacterial infection, it can start dropping down within 24 hours or so. Uh, so as you saw, the half-life is about 20 to 24 hours. So given an appropriate antibiotic for a couple of days prior to getting the first PCT, you may be back in the normal range um, or just above the normal range. So you may miss the peak. That's why it's very important for the emergency room to get the first sample in the emergency room, as then you have your baseline, because oftentimes it'll go up before it comes down and turns around. So it is important to get that very first sample as early as possible. Um, and you may get a false negative if you have already had a couple of days of antibiotics, just like blood cultures. If you've already had blood cultures, if you already had a couple of days of antibiotics as an outpatient with an oral antibiotic, and you do blood culture in the emergency room, they may be negative because of the fact they've already had some antibiotics on board. Um, but yeah, good question. Great, thank you. Okay, next question. Was your pharmacy team involved in creating protocols for PCT testing and antibiotic usage? Well, we do have or have had an antibiotic stewardship program where pharmacists have reached out and called physicians saying that you've got a negative PCT, you're on these antibiotics, and you have a positive viral. And for the most part, they'll get a good response and discontinuation of antibiotics. You've got to make sure, of course, there's nothing else going on, like a UTI or something else where they may need an antibiotic. Um, but they do the due diligence for that. And uh, it's been fairly successful, um, but it can be physician-dependent on whether they, they actually follow the algorithm or not. So it's more education is needed, clearly, everywhere. Great, thank you. We have so many great questions coming in. Okay, let's see. Our next question is, um, let's see. You have recommended educating the clinical team, but what is the best platform for this? Webinars or in-services? Brand rounds? What grabs the clinician's attention to act on these tests? I think a combination of, say, um, Grand rounds or little group meetings within departments to show them the data. I think if you show data, that helps. That we had this number of bacterial infections, this number of viral infections proven by the viral panel, a negative PCT, let's say, and we continued antibiotics for this number of days. Is there any way we can improve on this? Um, so I think education is key, and I think grand rounds are important. And also, um, I think within department meetings, looking at data, because physicians by nature can be competitive, and uh, given a challenge, uh, an appropriate challenge, they can rise to that. So, um, and it's important to show data, uh, your local data as to how this happens, because, you know, a study performed in a teaching hospital somewhere uh, showing X result doesn't often translate to what's happening in the community. But then sometimes we find that some of the studies coming out of teaching hospitals are 
the published but show that they didn't follow protocol and that's why they were negative. So, you know, education is the key. Great, thank you. Okay, next question. It is unlikely to have virus and bacterial infection at the same time. If the virus is positive, would adding PCT not be cost effective? Do you suggest both respiratory, RDT, and PCT together for all patients or only for selected PTS? It seems not cost effective to perform both tests in all patients. Yeah, I think if you have a clinical syndrome, now both of those case studies I showed were non-bacterial, and there was enough in the history to suggest that they were viral. In the second case, the family members were sick, which doesn't happen with a bacterial infection. So you had a good idea that this was going to be a non-bacterial infection. So RVP alone would have been fine. And the RVP there was positive for hemometanumovirus, and you know there's no treatment for that specifically, just symptomatic treatment. Um, in the first case, there's a combination of CHF, trauma causing the elevated D-dimer, CT angel was negative for PE, and both the studies were negative. I think when it's very straightforward, one test or the other is fine. But I find that from my experience where I'm working in the hospitals that I work at, a single PCT often isn't enough for a physician to say, I'm not going to do this. So we might get a second PCT on the second day, and that really confirms that the negative predictive value is very high with two PCTs, and then you might not need the viral. Except for the benefits of doing the viral is that you now know if it is positive that you have a virus that requires isolation, may not require hospitalization, because um, if you don't isolate that patient with, say, RSV, um, then they're going to spread it. And then that, that affects your staff, it affects fellow patients. So it is helpful having this information. Um, you know? Great. Thank you. Just a reminder for our audience, you can still submit questions at this point. Um, we're receiving so many. Any questions we do not get to, we will make sure to follow up after the webinar is over. Well, it looks like that's all we have time for today. Um, I want to there thank was you. One, oh. So there was one other question I saw here about the uh, low incidence. It says low incidence. Uh, one study showed a low incidence of combined bacterial and viral. But I think it's we've seen mm -hmm. a higher incidence of both, especially in the flu season, and patients will get post-viral uh, bacterial infections as well. So I think they can benefit in the sicker patients to know exactly what you're dealing with. Anyway, Perfect. sorry. Thank Go you. on. No, that's okay. Thank you. All right. Well, I'd like to thank the audience for joining us today and for their questions. So any questions we did not have time for today, and those submitted during the on-demand period will be addressed by the speaker via the contact information you provided at the time of registration. This webcast can be viewed on-demand. Labroots will alert you when it's available for replay. We encourage you to share that email with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. Until next time, goodbye.